assalamu alaikum this is lecture 24 of data security and encryption and in this lecture i am going to discuss about message authentication code one of the most fascinating and complex areas of cryptography is that of message authentication and the related area of digital signatures so here are the lecture contents uh, at the start uh, we will discuss into the introduction of the requirements of authentication and digital signatures and there were different types of attacks that will be countered in the security of message authentication system then there are different kind of message authentication code uh, the one is based on the hash functions and this chapter will also examine its design objectives algorithms and security the other message authentication codes are based on block ciphers uh, known as data authentication algorithm and cipher based message authentication code named as CMAC. And there is a, uh, another algorithm uh, based on authentication encryption counter with CBC counter block chaining message authentication code. Finally, there will be a key wrapping and unwrapping algorithm along with the pseudo random number generation using the hash function and message authentication codes so let's start with the message authentication requirements so before discussing about the message authentication codes let's have a brief look at the uh, identified attacks in context of communication over the network the simplest kind of attack is the disclosure of information or traffic analysis. So these two attacks have been discussed widely over the period of this course. So disclosure of information is the release of message contents to any unauthorized person uh, with the or process not possessing the appropriate cryptographic key. Similarly, traffic analysis refers to the discovery of the pattern of the traffic between two parties host and the uh, destination the uh, traffic analysis uh, is more concerned with the connection and it is a connection oriented attack the frequency and duration of connections could be determined so in either a connection oriented or connection less environment the number and the length of messages between the parties could be determined in these kind of attacks so masquerading uh, refers to the ingestion of messages into the network from a fraudulent, uh, fraudulent source. So if there is a third party who is uh, not authorized to be a part of your communication, it masquerades to be or claims to be a third party which uh, is an uh, authorized party. So this includes the creation of messages by opponent that are purpose to come from the authorized entity also include or fraudulent acknowledgments of messages received or non received by someone other than the messaging uh, message recipient then uh, there are three simple kind of attacks uh, content modification and sequence modification uh, and timing attacks or uh, timing modification so content modification refers to the changes to the contents of the messages including insertion, deletion, transposition and modification. Sequence modification, any modification to a sequence of messages between parties including insertion, deletion and reordering. Similarly timing modification delay is equal to delay or uh, replay of the messages. So in a connectionless application an individual message or datagram could be delayed or replayed. Finally, there are two uh, attacks refer to the repudiation, source repudiation and destination repudiation. Source repudiation attack is the denial of transmission by the uh, denial of the transmission of message by the source and the denial of the receipt by the message uh, by the destination is referred as destination repudiation. So as you are well aware, uh, there has been measures to deal with the first two attacks uh, in the realm um, of the confidentiality and they have been dealt uh, with the detail in the 
first few lectures. So, measures to deal with uh, item number three from masquerading to the item number six uh, to the timing modification uh, list are generally regarded as message authentication and mechanism for dealing specifically with the uh, source repudiation comes under the heading of digital signatures. So generally a digital signature technique will also counter some or all of the attacks listed under the item number 3 to 6. So dealing with the last kind of attack uh, destination repudiation may require a combination to use digital signature and a protocol design to counter this attack. So if you look in the summary, the message authentication is a procedure to verify that the received message is come from the alleged source and have not been altered. Message authentication may also verify sequencing and timeliness. A digital signature is an authentication technique that also includes measures to counter repudiation by source. So any message authentication function or digital signature mechanism has two levels of functionality, the lower level and a higher level. At lower level, there must be some sort of function that produces an authenticator. Authenticator is a value to be used to authenticate a message and a receiver should verify the authenticity of the message at the lower level. Similarly, this lower level function is then used as a primitive in higher level authentication protocol which also enables the receiver to verify the authenticity of the message. So they, uh, these may be grouped into three classes hash functions, message encryption and message authentication code. A hash function as discussed in the last lectures a hash function that maps a message of any length into a fixed length hash value which serves as an authenticator. The message encryption and message authentication code will be discussed in this lecture. The message encryption refers to the cipher text of the entire message serves as its authenticator. And in message authentication code, a function of the message and a secret key that produces a fixed length value will serve as an authenticator. So hash functions and how they serve for the message authentication are discussed previously. The remainder of this lecture will briefly examine the remaining two techniques. So the message encryption by itself can provide a measure of authentication. This analysis differs for symmetric and public key encryption scheme. So you consider the straightforward use of symmetric encryption as referred in the first part or A part of this diagram. A message M transmitted from a source A to the destination B is encrypted using a secret key K shared by A and B. So no other party can recover the plain text of the message. So in symmetric encryption, the confidentiality and authentication is provided using the KK. So if you use the public key encryption, uh, the confidentiality is only provided when you use the public key to encode the message and the private key to decode the message M. Similarly, uh, if you use the public key encryption with the private key encryption and the public key description, uh, authentication and signature, uh, digital signature is also provided. So if you use the public key, uh, sorry, private key encryption along with the public key encryption uh, on the both sides of encryption and decryption, it will provide confidentiality, authentication and digital signature. So in addition, B is assured that the message was generated by A. The message must have come from the A because A is the only other party that possesses the key in each of these cases. 
and therefore the only other party with the information necessary to construct the ciphertext can be decrypted with the key. Furthermore, if the message is recovered, only B knows that none of its bits of the message have been altered because an opponent that does not know the key would not know how to alter the message bits in the cipher text to produce the desired changes in the plain text. So we may say that symmetric encryption provides authentication as well as confidentiality. However, it may be difficult to determine it automatically if the incoming ciphertext decrypts to an readable or unreadable plain text. So if the plain text is a binary object file or digitized image, determination of properly formed and therefore authentication plain text may be difficult. Therefore, an opponent could achieve certain level of disruption simply by issuing messages with the random content uh, addition to come from a legitimate user. So one solution to this problem is to force the plain text to have some kind of structure as described here that is easily recognized when uh, but cannot be replicated without recourse to the encryption function. We could for example append an error detecting code also known as frame check sequence as described with the function f of m in both encryption and decryption. Similarly there can be a simply a function by an external party into the both encryption and decryption. So A prepares the plain text message m as described here and then the block is encrypted with the uh, frame check sequence. The frame check sequence is appended to the message and then the entire block is then encrypted. So at the destination B decrypts the incoming block uh, using the key and checks it for the F the S frame check sequence. So you have to note that B has to apply the same function to check the frame check sequence. So if the calculated frame check sequence is equal to the incoming frame check sequence, then the message is considered authentic. It is unlikely that any random sequence of bits would exhibit the desired relationship. Note that the order in which the frame check sequence and encryption functions are performed is very critical. The sequence illustrated in the first diagram is referred as internal error control which authors the second diagram with the external error control. So with internal error control authentication is provided because an opponent would have difficulty generating ciphertext that will be decrypted would have the valid error control bits. So if instead the frame check sequence is the outer code of an opponent can construct messages with the valid error control code. Although the opponent cannot know what the decrypted plain text will be or he or she can still hope to create a confusion and disrupt operation. So the error code is just one example. In fact, any sort of structuring can be added to the transmitted message serves to strengthen the authentication capability. Such structure is provided by the use of a communication architecture consisting of layered protocols. As an example, consider the structure of the messages transmitted using the TCP IP protocol architecture. So this shows a format of a TCP segment illustrating the TCP header. Suppose that each pair of the host shared a unique secret key so that all exchanges between a pair of hosts 
use the same key regardless of the application then we could simply encrypt all of the datagrams except the IP header again if the opponent substituted some arbitrary bit pattern for the encrypted TCP segment the resulting plain text would not include a meaningful header so in this case the header includes only a checksum which covers the header but also other useful information such as sequence number because successive TCP segments on a given connection are numbered sequentially. Encryption ensures that the opponent does not delay, misorder or delete any segment. So as described many times that straightforward use of public key encryption provides confidentiality but it does not provide the authentication of the source. To provide both uh, confidentiality and authentication, A can encrypt the message first using its private key which provides the digital signature and then using B's public key which provides the confidentiality. The disadvantage of public key encryption is that the public key algorithm must be exercised four times rather than two times in each communication. So an alternate authentication technique involves the use of secret key to generate a small sized block of data known as cryptographic checksum or message authentication code that is appended to the message original message M and this technique assumes that two communicating parties Say for example in case source A and destination B share the secret key which is common between the source and the destination. When A has the message to send to B, it calculates the message authentication code as a function MAC with the key and M of the cipher text. Where M is the input message, C is the MAC function, and K is the secret key. So this message plus the message authentication code are transmitted to intended recipients. The recipients perform the same calculation on the received message using the same secret key to generate a new message authentication code. The received message authentication com code is compared and calculated me uh, calculated met uh, message authentication code. If we assume that only the receiver and the sender know the identity of the secret key and if the received MAC matches the calculated match, then the receiver is assured that the message has not been altered. So guarantee number one is checked. If an attacker alters the message but does not alter the message authentication code, then the receiver's calculation of MAC will differ from the received MAC because the attacker is assumed not to know the secret key. The attacker cannot alter the MAC to correspond the alteration in the message. The receiver is assured that the message is from the alleged sender because no one else knows the secret key no one else could prepare the message with the proper message authentication code. So if the message includes the sequence number such as is used in many applications with the TCP, the receiver can be assured of the proper sequence because an attacker cannot successfully alter the sequence number. Similarly, a MAC function is similar to encryption. One difference is that MAC algorithm need not to be reversible. So as it must be for the decryption, in general the MAC function is many to one function. For example, suppose that we are using 100 bit messages in 10 bit MAC code, message authentication code, then there are total of 2 raised to power 100 different messages but only 2 raised to power 10 different message authentication codes. So on average, each 
mag value is generated by total of 2 raised to the power 100 divided by 2 raised to the power 10 which is equal to 2 raised to the power 90 different messages so if a 5 bit key is used then there are 2 raised to the power 5 different mappings which is equal to 32 and if it it turns out that the messages of the mathematical properties of authentication function it is less vulnerable out to being broken than encryption the process here depicts uh, and provides uh, authentication but not confidentiality because message as a whole is transmitted in clear confidentiality can be provided by performing message encryption as described in the second example or before the message authentication algorithm as described in the third example so in both these two cases the two separate keys are needed each of which is shared by the sender and the uh, receiver so in the first case the mac is calculated with the message as input and then it is concatenated with the message the entire block is encrypted again to produce the encrypted text uh, known as ciphertext. In the cipher case, the message is encrypted first with the key used by the sender and the receiver. Then a MAC is calculated using the resulting cipher text and which is concatenated to ciphertext to form the transmitted block. So taking into account of type of attacks described in the second slide, the MAC need to satisfy the following requirement. The first requirement deals with the message replacement attack in which an opponent is able to construct a new message to match a given message authentication code, even though the opponent does not know and does not learn the key. The second requirement deals with the need to thwart a brute force attack based on the chosen plain text. The final requirement dictates that the authentication algorithm should not be weaker with respect to certain parts of bits of the message than others. So there should be some uniformity of the algorithm over the whole cipher text. So if you consider the brute force attack on a message authentication system or message authentication code, it is more difficult uh, undertaking than the brute force attack on a hash function because it requires known message tag pairs. So let us see why it is so dif difficult. To attack a hash code, it requires known message hash tag pairs and a brute force method of finding a collusion is to pick a random bit string y and check if h of y is equal to h of x. Similarly, the attacker could do repeatedly uh, is this step offline. Whether an offline attack can be used on message authentication code algorithm depends on the relative size of the key and the tag. The attacker uh, would like to come up with a valid message authentication code for a given message attack and there are two lines of attack. The first refers to the attack on the key space and the, the second refers to the attack on the MAC value. So if the attacker can determine the MAC key then it is possible to generate a valid MAC value for any input X. On the other hand in the attack on the MAC value the objective is to generate a valid tag for a given message or to find a message that matches a given tag. So if the attacker can determine the first uh, attack, the MAC key, then it is possible to generate a valid MAC value. Suppose the key size is uh, any bits and then the attacker has one known text to tag pair, then the attacker can compute the end bit tag on the known text for all possible keys. So at least one key is guaranteed to produce the correct tag, namely the valid key 
that was initially used to produce the known tax tag phase. This phase of the attack takes the level of effort to the proportional 2 raised to power k that is one operation for each of the 2 raised to power k possible p values. However, as this was described earlier, because the MAC is many to one mapping, there may be other keys that produce the correct value. Thus, if more than one key is found to produce the correct value, additional tax tag phase must be tested. So it can be shown that the high level of effort drop offs rapidly with each additional tax max pair that is overall level of effort is roughly around 2 raised to power k. So an attacker can also work on the tag without attempting to recover the key. Here the objective is to generate a valid tag on a given message or to find a message that matches a given tag. So in either the level of effort is comparable to the attacking uh, the one way or the weak collusion resistant of the hash code or 2 raised to power n. So in the case of MAC the attack cannot be conducted offline without further input. The attack will require chosen text pairs or the knowledge of the key. The other kind of attack is cryptanalysis. So as with the encryption algorithm and the hash function, cryptanalytic attacks seek to exploit some property of the algorithm to perform some attack other than the exhaustive search such as in the brute force attack. The, the way to measure the resistance of a MAC algorithm to cryptanalysis is compare its strength to the effort required for a brute force attack. That is an ideal MAC algorithm will require crypto cryptanalytic effort greater than or equal to the brute force effort. So there is much more variety in the structure of message authentication codes than the hash function. So it is difficult to generalize about the cryptanalysis of message authentication codes. Message authentication codes can be based on the hash function and this has traditionally been the most common approach of constructing the message authentication code and there has been increased interest in the development of MAC derived from the cryptographic hash functions. The motivations for this interest are cryptographic hash functions such as MD4 and SHA generally execute faster in software and symmetric block ciphers such as DES. Therefore, most of the message authentication codes have been based on the uh, hash functions. And there is a wide variety of library code for cryptographic function is available online. So with the development of advanced encryption standard and the more wide uh, widespread availability of the code for the encryption algorithms, these considerations are less significant but hash based message authentication codes continue to be widely used. As hash functions such as SHA secure hash algorithm was not designed to use as a message authentication code and cannot be used directly for that purpose because it does not rely on the secret key there have been a number of protocols uh, and proposals for the incorporation of the secret key into the existing hash algorithm the approach that has received the most support is referred as hash message authentication code or in simple HMAC and it has been chosen as a mandatory to implement for MAC for IP security and it has also been issued as a NIST standard FIPS 198. RFC 2104 listed the following design objectives for hashed message authentication code. First of all, to use it without modification available hash functions. In particular, to use hash functions that perform well in software and for which code is freely and widely available. Secondly, it is uh, these are used to allow for easy replaceability of the embedded hash functions in case uh, faster or more secure hash functions are found or required. Thirdly, these are used to pro 
preserve the original performance of the hash function without incurring significant decreation to use the handle keys in a simple way and to have well understood cryptographic analysis of the uh, strength of the authentication mechanism based on the reasonable assumption about the embedded hash function. The first two objectives are important to the acceptability of hashed message authentication. Hashed message authentication treats the hash function as a black box. This has two benefits. First, an existing implementation of hash function can be used to module in implementing hash message authentication code. In this way, the bulk of code is prepackaged and ready to use without modification. Secondly, if it is ever desired to replace a given hash function in this implementation, all it is required to remove the existing hash function module and drop in the new module. This would be done if a faster hash function was desired. More important, if the security of the embedded hash function were compromised, the security of hash match function could be retained simply by replacing embedded hash function with a more secure hash function such as secure hash function 2 or secure hash function 3 replacement. The last design objective is in the preceding list uh, is the in fact the main advantage of hashed function authentication over uh, other proposed hash based scheme. This can be proven secure provided uh, that the embedded hash function has some reasonable cryptographic strength. So this figure shows the overall operations in hash message authentication and the major part is the hash function which can be an embedded hash function such as SH1 or MD5. There is an initial value input to the hash function referred as IV. The original message M is the referred as the message input to hash message authentication code and in, includes the padding specified by the embedded hash function. The, uh, the set or the array Y is the ith block of the each of the message so M provided as an input. So L is the number of blocks in the length and the length start from the index 0 to L minus 1 and each block or uh, bit is referred as B in the block and there are total n number of lengths of bits uh, hash code produced in the embedded hash function. So it again uses a secret key recommended the length is greater than the n so if the greater if it is greater than the b then the key is input to the hash function and to produce the n bit key the term k plus referred as key padded with the zeros on the left so that the result is the p bits in the length the other two inputs are ipad and opad ipad is referred as uh, repeated B by 8 times and OPAD is also repeated by uh, B by 8 times and it can be uh, hexadecimal values in one byte. So we can describe the algorithm uh, by looking at this, uh, this uh, figure. So at the first step you have to append the zeros at the left of the K to create a B bit string referred as k plus so if the k is of this length of 160 bit the b is 512 bits then the k will be appended with the 44 zeros in the next the x or operations uh, bitwise exclusive or with the k plus and ipad is performed to produce the b bit block s of i and then you append the message to the S of I with the each bit uh, referred as B bit of block and the block is referred as Y with the position index from 0 to L minus 1. So in the next step you have to apply the hash function 
to the stream input and uh, generated in the previous step then again apply the XOR with the OPAD uh, to produce the with the K plus to produce the, the bits and append the hash result from here with the uh, as from the S0 with uh, the hash function result of the previous uh, step and finally apply the hash function to the stream generated from here and here combined to perform the final hash message authentication code So a more efficient implementation is possible as shown in this example here two quantities are pre-computed such as the function of initial vector along with the key input and ipad and the function of key input and opad with the initial vector so these are pre-computed to fast of the uh, uh, implementation and with this implementation only one additional stance of the compression function is added to processing normally produced by the hash function this uh, more efficient implementation is especially worthwhile if the most of the messages from the message authentication code is computed uh, or in short in length so the security of the hash message authentication code depends in some way on the cryptographic strength of the underlying hash function so appeal of the hash function uh, is that the designer have been able to prove an exact relationship between the strength of the embedded hash function and the strength of hash message authentication generally uh, expressed in terms of probability of the success forgery with a given amount of time spent for the forger and a given number of message tag pairs created by with the same key so the probability of the successful attack on hash message authentication code is equivalent to one of the following attacks for the embedded hash function first of all the attacker is able to compute an output of the compression function even with the initialization vector that is random secret and unknown to the attacker secondly the attacker finds the collusion in the hash function even when the initialization vector is random and secret now we look at the two message authentication codes that are based on the use of block cipher mode of operation so we begin with an older algorithm the data authentication algorithm which is now obsolete then we examine the cmac which is designed to overcome the deficiency of the data authentication algorithm the data authentication algorithm based on the data encryption standard has been one of the most widely used message authentication code for a number of years however as we discussed uh, security weaknesses in this algorithm have been discovered and it is being replaced by the newer stronger algorithm the algorithm can be defined using the cipher block chaining cbc mode of the operation of data encryption standard so with an initialization of the vector of zero the data messages or records or files or programs can be authenticated or grouped into continuous 64 bit blocks as represented in the top row so if necessary the final block is padded on the right with zeros to form a full 64 bit block using the data encryption algorithm e and a secret key k a data authentication code is calculated by performing uh, encryption uh, and using a key of 56 bit uh, as with the data encryption standard and input of 64 bit to produce the output of 64 bit 
and the final value is referred as data authentication code and it can be from 16 to 64 bits so as mentioned the data authentication algorithm has been widely adopted in government and the industry demonstrated that this method authentication code is secure under the reasonable set of security criteria so with the following restriction only messages of the one fixed length m and bits are processed where n is the cipher block size and m is a fixed positive integer so again the input uh, message is into a number of blocks m which is encrypted using the key k and fed to the next subsequent pass cmac is calculated with the cipher function of encryption performed using the uh, key and the first block and then each subsequent block is XORed with the previous block to form the encryption standard and finally the the message code is the most significant bit of t length is referred as t where t here is referred as message authentication code also referred as the tag the length of the t is the bit length of the message authentication code and msb is the most significant bit the s leftmost bit of the bit string x So authentication encryption uh, is referred as a term to describe the encryption system that simultaneously protect confidentiality and authenticity of the communication. Many applications and protocol require both form of security but until recently two services have been designed separately. The more common approaches to the providing both confidentiality and encryption for the message M. The first approach is referred as hashed followed by the encryption which we have discussed very recently. First compute the cryptographic hash function of the message and then encrypt the message plus the hash function value. The second approach is authentication followed by the encryption. So in this case you can use the two keys first authenticate the plain text by computing the MAC value and then encrypt the message plus the tag. This approach is taken by the secure socket layer TLS protocol. The third uh, approach is referred as encryption followed by the authentication. Again you have to use two keys first for encryption of the message to yield the cipher text and then authenticate the cipher text to yield the pair this approach is used as IP security protocol the fourth uh, approach is referred as independently encrypt and authenticate again use two keys encrypt the message to yield the cipher text authenticate the plain text with the T to yield the pair this approach is used by the SSH protocol so in this case both the decryption and verification are straightforward for each approach and there are security vulnerabilities for all of these approaches and no approach is error proof. So the other algorithm is counter with the cipher block chaining message authentication code in short terms as CCM and it was standardized by NIST specifically to store the uh, support the security requirements of IEEE 802 Wi-Fi wireless and local area networks. So variation of the encrypt and MAC approach to authenticate the encryption was defined by the NIST 838C standard. There are key algorithm ingredients are AES encryption algorithm, counter mode operation and CMAC authentication algorithm. The single key is used for the encryption and MAC algorithms. The input to the CCM encryption process consists of three elements. The first element refers as the data that will be both authenticated 
and encrypted and most of time it is a plain text of the data log. The second input is the associated data that the sender A that will be authenticated but will not be uh, encrypted. So an example is the protocol header that must be transmitted in the clear for proper protocol operation but which needs to be authenticated. And finally a nonce value N that is assigned to the payload and the associated data. This is a unique value that is different for every instance during the lifetime of the protocol association and it is intended to provide the replay tag and certain other types of tags. So this figure illustrates the operation of CCM cipher block code chaining encryption. For authentication the input includes the nonce value and the plain text and associated data. The input is formatted as a sequence of B blocks from B0 to BR. The first block contains the nonce plus some formatting bits that include the length of the N, A and the P elements. So this is followed by zero or more blocks that contain A followed by zero or more blocks that contain P. So the resulting sequence block serves as an input to the CMAC algorithm which produces a tag with the T length MAC value which is less than or equal to the block length. So for decryption a sequence uh, in co of counters is generated that must be independent of the nonce. The authentication tag is encrypted in the counter mode using the single value of the counter, which is counter zero. The T length is the most uh, the T length most significant bits of the output or X odd with the uh, tag to produce the encrypted tag. The remaining counters are used for the counter mode encryption in the plain text. The encrypted plain text is concatenated with the encrypted tag to form the cipher text. So this is a relatively complex algorithm. Note that it requires two complete passes through the plain text once to generate MAC uh, value and once to encrypt the message. To transmit. Further, the details of the specification require a trade off between the length of the nonce and the length of the tag, which is unnecessary restriction. Also, note that the encryption key is used twice with the counter encryption mode once to generate the tag and once to encrypt the plain text, as described here and here. Whether these complexities add this to the security of algorithm is not clear. In any case, two analyses of the algorithms conclude that the CCM provides a high level of security. So most recent block cipher mode of operation is defined by NIST is a key wrap algorithm and it uses the advanced encryption standard or triple data encryption standard as underlying encryption algorithms. The purpose is to securely exchange a symmetric key to be shared by two parties using the symmetric key already shared by those parties. The latter key is called the key encryption key. Therefore, two questions need to be addressed at this point. First, why do we need a symmetric key already known to two parties to encrypt a new symmetric key? Quite often, a protocol calls for hierarchy of the keys, with keys on the lower hierarchy used more frequently and changed more frequently to block the attacks. A higher level key, which is used in the frequently uh, and which is used infrequently and therefore more resistant to cryptanalysis, and it is used to encrypt an entirely new created lower level key so that it can be exchanged between parties 
that shares the high level key the second question is that why do we need a new mode the intent of the new mode is to operate on keys which uh, whose length is greater than the block size of the encryption algorithm so for example aes uses block of 128 bits but can only use the key size of 128 192 or 256 bits so in the latter two cases the encryption of the key involves the multiple blocks we consider the value of key data to be greater than the value of the other data because the key will be used multiple times and compromise the key uh, compromise of the all key compromises of all the data encrypted with the key so the key wrap is a robust in the sense that each of the bit of the output can be expected to depend on non-trivial fashion on each of the bit input this is not the case for any other modes of the operation that we have described so for example in all of the modes described so far the last of the block plain text only influence the last block of the cipher text similarly the first block of cipher text is derived only from the first block of the plain text so to achieve this robust operation key wrap achieves a considerably lower throughput than the other modes but the trade off may be appropriate for some key management application also key wrap is only used for a small amount of plain text compared to say encryption of a message or a file so this figure shows the key wrapping algorithm for encrypting a 256 bit key each box represents an encryption stage one value of t from t1 to t24 note that the a output is fed to uh, is uh, the block t as input to the next stage t plus 1 output of each block is fed to the next block whereas the R output skips the forward n stages so if you can look at the R that each block skips the four blocks to input to the next blocks this arrangement further increases the avalanche effect of the mixing of the bits to achieve this skipping of stages a sliding buffer is used so that the R output from the stage T is shifted to the buffer one position for each stage until it becomes the input for the stage T plus N. So this figure simply depicts the operation of the stage T for the uh, for the 256 bit key. The dashed feedback line indicates the assignment of new values to the stage variable. pseudo random number can also be generated using the hash functions and message authentication code and essential elements of any pseudo random number generators are seed value and deterministic algorithm for generating the string pseudo random number bits so there are two approaches if the algorithm is used as a pseudo random function prf to produce a required value the seed should only be known to the user of the prf on the other hand, if the algorithm is used to produce the stream encryption function, then the seed has the tool of a secret key that must be known to the sender and the receiver. So a hash function or a message authentication code produces apparently random output and can be used to build a pseudo random number generator. So this figure shows the basic strategy for hash based pseudo random number generator specified by the NIST SP890 and ISO 18031. So the algorithm takes the V value with a plus one increment for each step and cryptographic hash function is performed to produce the pseudo random function generator. Similarly, the HMATH function uses the same V value and a key to produce the pseudo random number generation and each pseudo random number generation output is again fed to the input of the pseudo random number generator HMAC function. So the SP890 specification also provides 
for periodically updating the value of the V to enhance the security. The specification also indicates that there are no known or suspected weaknesses in the hash based approach for the strong cryptographic hash algorithm such as SHA2. So it is a good practice to compare the recommendation with the use of HMAC for a pseudo random number generator in some application uh, as shown in this table. So for IEEE 800.802.11 uh, wireless LAN security standards, the data input consists of the seed concatenated with the counter. As you can see here that if you loop through the message there will be a counter associated with the uh, value of the authentication code. The counter is incremented for each block of the word of the output. The approach would seem to offer enhanced security compared to this approach. So consider that SP890 the data input to the output block WI is just the output of WI minus 1, the previous execution of HMAC. Thus, the an opponent was able to observe the pseudo random output, knows the input and output of HMAC. Even so, with the assumption of HMAC is secure, the knowledge of input and output should not be sufficient to recover the K and hence not sufficient to predict the pseudo random number bits. So the approach taken by the transport layer security protocol and the wireless transport layer security protocol also invoking the hash message authentication code twice for the each block of the output WI. So as with the uh, IEEE 80211, this is done in such a way that the output does not yield the direct information about the input. The doable of HMAC doubles with the execution burden and would seem to be security over kill. So for mac uh, authentic approach, there are two inputs in the key and the V as described in the NIST SP800 standard. Here are the summary contents that we have examined in this lecture. We started with the message authentication requirements and then we discussed message authentication functions named as message encryption and message authentication code. After requirements analysis of the message authentication code, we discussed some security attacks on the message authentication code named as brute force and script analysis. And both attacks are very difficult to conduct on the uh, message authentication code. So there are different kind of message authentication code. One of the famous one is the hash message authentication code and we discussed some design objectives and algorithms of the hash, hash message authentication code. There will be some other, uh, there was some other uh, message authentication codes such as data authentication algorithms and CMAX based on the cipher block chaining. And there is a authentication encryption that is known as CMM, CCM and the key wrapping algorithm was discussed. And finally, the implementation of hash function and message authentication code to produce the pseudo random number genera uh, generation is also discussed. So if you want to study more about the topic, you can read chapter number 12 of the recommended book or you can conduct any question and answer session. Thank you very much.